Okay, well, it, uh, I'm Stephen Harris, and I, I'm sitting in Sydney, and in this uh, first for me, going live on a streaming uh, event, and it's quite, uh, I guess, mind-boggling to think about the technology that's able to bring us together, let alone the time zones, and uh, I guess everyone's willingness to contribute as well. So. Uh, we can introduce different people to you just very quickly as we go through. We've got time now just to, uh, to get ourselves established and perhaps allow some others to tune in wherever they are. But we have, uh, we have Will Richardson, who's currently in New Jersey. Good morning, everyone. Uh, now, Will has just let us know that his family, he and his family are recovering from the coronavirus and we, we, we wish them well and uh, I guess we're really encouraged to see him able to participate today so thank you for that. We have uh, two people in Reykjavik, Island, Iceland, Thigalug and Orsta uh, and they're going to be joining us for the second presentation so we say welcome to them as well. Uh, yes. Hello everyone. <laughs> And then we swing across to the UK and we have Becky Parker, who's located near Canterbury, south of London. So uh, it's you now good afternoon to you, Becky, in your time. Yeah. Hello, everyone. And then we have Matt, who's uh, on the other, not too far away from me in Sydney, but uh, over near the, uh, the coast. Uh, so welcome, Matt. Great to have you here as well. Thank you so much. Nice to be here. So the, the format, just to, to help everyone who's listening sort of know what we're going to be doing, I'll, I'll give it just a bit of a brief introduction now, and then we're going to move um, through the four different presentations. And then after that, there'll be a Q&A time. Now, if you want to send a question to the Q&A, that's best done via the Twitter hashtag using relearn2020. So we would ask you to use that. Uh, I have Devon, who is um, one of my colleagues from Learn Life in Barcelona, is going to be reading that Twitter feed, and then he'll be sending through some of the messages uh, and questions via via a different tool, so that I can read those as we're going through. Um, we obviously won't be able to answer all questions. We've already received many, many questions via the Alliance webpage. Um, and that's been fantastic that we have grouped those questions to sort of see what are the key topics as well. We, we would like you to do a couple of things rather than just launching forth right now. Um, we do have the ability to connect via Twitter and I will look forward to reading the Twitter feed afterwards so that whatever you do, can you please put the hashtag relearn2020. We're going to suggest that you might tell us where you are, uh, where you're joining into this, this uh, live streaming event. That, that would be of interest. We're also going to suggest that um, different time zones, different places. Um, I have my sparkling water. My colleagues all said, OK, no wine, um, even though it's nighttime here in Australia. Um, so you might like to have a hashtag, whether it's coffee or water or beer or wine, whatever else you're doing. We, we won't ask any questions if it's early morning for you and you're already drinking wine. That's fine. So you might like to do that. And then I'm also going to suggest I've already put up a picture on the Twitter feed of my feet. Uh, what's on your toes at the moment? Are you wearing shoes? Are you wearing socks? Are you barefoot like I am, pretending that I'm all fully, fully clothed? Um, just as a little bit of fun on that Twitter feed as well, because I think it's, uh, it's important that we can <laughs> connect, laugh and smile together uh, in these times as well. So that's my encouragement to everyone to, uh, to put that onto the Twitter feed. And uh, so that's, that's the beverage that you're having, where you're located, and perhaps show a picture of your computer, laptop, screen, and your feet, if you can do that going through. That's your, that's your challenge as you listen through. Well, we, we called the series Relearn, and I guess as I, we were thinking through the title of that, I was talking with uh, Christopher Pomeranning, who's the, the founder of the Learn Life Project, and we were thinking through what, what could we call the series, and I guess we, you know, thinking through Alvin Toffler's comment from 1970 is amazing when you think about it, the, the learn that the 21st century is the time that we have to uh, focus on learning, unlearning, and relearning, or the people who will be illiter who who will be effectively illiterate will be those who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. And I, I guess it struck me that we're, we're 20 years into the, the century. 
we really are at the time now when we have to relearn. Okay, we've, we've, there's been a lot of learning, a lot of unlearning that's been happening. But if we don't start relearning, then we're going to get stuck. And I think, you know, what an amazing opportunity before us now as we think through this this one event, this pandemic has sort of stopped everyone short and, and enabled everyone to reflect. I guess it's a forced reflection. But as we do that, I guess there's a... We, we know that in the days, weeks, months ahead, there's going to be a lot of thinking, a lot of um, lot of debate, a lot of conversation. Uh, I'm trying not to allow my head to go too far ahead and say what's going to be like at the other end. You know, what's 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 going to be different? What will be changed? Um, I, I put up a tweet earlier this week and basically with pictures of, a, of some kids jumping in a field. And I just thought, I just cannot imagine kids wanting to go back into a traditional classroom sitting in rows when all they'll want to do is to get outside and enjoy each other's company and to see the world. Um, but that's speculating again. And I think it's, it's healthy for us to sort of start thinking those things through as well. So th this, uh, I guess, the capacity to meet now is come about because we can collaborate together in this way with technology, which is amazing. Um, we've, we've all started to become very aware of the problems and the challenges that have come out uh, as a result of the, the world being thrust into this complete new direction of learning um, for, for many, many um, people in the world. We also recognize that there are a number of people who haven't got access to either a device and also to to the Wi-Fi or to the internet in different ways. And we would be calling on our governments and any government of the world to think about what they can be doing there because it's, it's, uh, it's a time when we can reflect on the fact that we need to be ready for these things and we need to be able to help each other. And there's not too many easy answers uh, immediately for people who are in that context who are not able to be connected by technology to, to the opportunity to learn, but we also know that we can learn anywhere, anytime, anyhow. Um, what was really interesting for me, because uh, I have spent the, the last week making some different um, supplementary interviews as well, is that as I listened to the six different speakers, uh, I started off that process with the challenge of, well, you know, how, how do we navigate this time in, uh, in education? And by the end of the, the six conversations, there was a very clear pathway for me, it, and it was all to do with families. And that what I found it fascinating was that all of the interviews that you'll get to to, uh, to see as well and to be able to download those, um, all from very different perspectives, but the one common thread for me was families. And I guess families are at the core of what's actually happening at the moment because we're, we're all uh, shut down, locked down with our families. And, uh, and I guess it's only right then that we think through perhaps that the impact of families and how families can be part of the, the way ahead. I'd, I'd like to uh, just acknowledge now that the conversations I have had with Professor Yong Zhao, and that one's already been available for people to, uh, to download and listen to. Um, also, uh, a wonderful time with Sarah Martin, who's the principal of Stonefield School in Auckland in New Zealand. And Sarah gives some very, very um, powerful insights into, I guess, what you can do from the school level, especially in her case, a, a, a primary and middle school sort of aged um, group. Um, a wonderful conversation with Devin Carberry from uh, Learn Life Barcelona, and as he's reflected on the journey for us as an organisation as going through from a, uh, a, a program that was very heavily relational face to face and having to then find way, ways of um, of creating that same sense of confidence, trust and relationship in the virtual space. Also, an interview with uh, David Price from um, from the Northern UK, um, a wonderful one. I'm, I'm not sure whether it will make itself through to the cut, but he did sing What a Wonderful World with his, with his sort of um, miniature guitar at the very end for us. Uh, I'm very tempted to add that one in because it was a really nice finish to that particular interview. Uh, we also interviewed Bayer Best from, from Berlin and Bayer, who's just um, published a new book, which is about co-learning. And I love her chapter titles, are, they're in German and I, I'm yet to learn German, but fun, adventure and play, I think were the three three sections. And and lastly, um, a valuable time with Alfredo Hernando, uh, who is living in 
Vienna and in Austria and his perspectives from an academic, a, psycholo a psychological, and also from a parental perspective. So very different uh, interviews. We will be planning to get those all out within the next week and then have uh, some summary takeaway notes as well, just as we will, we will uh, um, capture the different presentations that are about to happen now and send those out. So my thank you to all the people who have made this possible, the people behind the scenes and to the uh, people who've done the interviews already, but especially now to the live group. And with all of that, Will, we're gonna hand over to you and I'm looking forward to hearing what you're saying because I've been reading your tweets and other comments in social media and loving the strength of your statement. So I'll, I'll pass over to you. Well, thanks so much, Stephen. And uh, it's great to see you and the others and uh, to be, with over 600 people from around the world this morning is is really uh, uh, an honor on some level and, and a real kick on another level. And it does speak to this moment and the ways in which we can connect and share. And despite the difficulties that I know many of us are experiencing, um, this has been a very interesting few weeks when you can kind of step back from it a little bit and um, and just look at the ways in which people are beginning to network and connect and the implications for all of that on learning. Um, it's, uh, I think at some point when we have a little bit more of a chance to, to get away from it and get some distance from it, I think we're gonna look back on this as a very profound moment for education and learning. And I just, to start, let me just make sure, can you see my slides? Are we good on that? All good? Yep, okay. So I just wanna start by saying, you know, that I, I wanna recognize that we're all kind of in survival mode right now, um, that it is really just about getting through this moment and the difficulties of this moment. And um, that uh, the things that I'm gonna talk about um, in these 15 minutes or so are meant to provoke, but not now. Um, they're meant to get you thinking a little bit when you have basically some time to breathe. And when you have a moment when it's not just kind of getting through the day, but it really is an, an opportunity to reflect. And I think it's an opportunity too for us to ask a lot of questions that are very important to ask that we have been asking for a long time, but that may have new meaning today because of what we experienced. And I just wanna to try to tease a little bit of that out um, in, this, in this presentation. So, um, you know, the old story of school is already changing. It already was changing. There are lots of people who have begun to push back against that traditional structure, the traditional narrative, the ways in which we um, still do school today, even though it was created a couple of centuries ago. And it is interesting that much like media, much like politics, business, everything is kind of in this moment of being in between stories. And that's a Ural Harari quote that I love, and um, you can see it. I mean, you can you can look at some examples. I don't know if you've seen mastery.org, but that's a group of independent schools and international schools and public schools from around the world who have been pushing really hard about getting all numbers and grades off of transcripts because basically they see that as not a great um, uh, way to, to ask kids to learn. That's not, it doesn't really promote learning. And some of the schools that have been involved with that have been, you know, are, are some of the quote unquote best schools in the world. And they are looking at a different way, a different way of thinking about assessment and about the ways that we rank and score. So that part of the narrative has, has really um, been, been up for a lot of conversation of late. One group that I'm really impressed with too in the States is Education Reimagined where there are a lot of conversations now about equity and social justice and the ways in which things um, are playing out for um, some kids, but not for others. And then of course, learn life too. I mean, I wanna recognize the work that Stephen and, and others in that organization have been doing in order to provoke different conversations around what schools not only could be, but should be. And so I, I wanna just acknowledge that there's been this growing tension that has been uh, already that we've been experiencing about schools and about what education is in this moment. And it's not an easy moment. It's not an easy conversation for people to have. There's, there's a lot of resistance to it. And it is, again, using this Harari quote, um, because we're in this very interesting moment where people are losing faith with the traditional system 
but we haven't figured out what the new story is. We haven't figured out what that new narrative looks like, what that new experience of school will be for kids. But I think more and more people are coming to the conclusion today that it's gonna be different, that it has to be different from what it's been. And basically this crisis, I think, has just shifted all of that discussion and thinking into overdrive because it is now we are seeing a real alternative to the systems and the structures that we've used in the past. You can find all sorts of, of articles, all sorts of people now who are beginning to try to figure out what does this mean? How is this going to reshape education um, or change it or, or leave us with a much different experience from school? But the question that I've been asking, and I think a lot of other people are asking too, is, is this really new or is this old stories in new spaces, right? Are we trying to take traditional schooling and kind of fit it into this on-demand environment that we've created given the response that we've, that we've put together for this crisis? Are we really doing online learning or are we really doing online schooling? And um, I think I would argue that most of us, most of what I've seen basically is um, more leaning toward online schooling than, than online learning. And again, um, here in the States, at least, you can find examples of all sorts of schools who are stressed and worried because their, their kids, um, they don't want their kids to fall behind. They don't want them to you know, lose track of the curriculum. They, they are looking for ways to um, in some cases, not only send food home to children who need it, which is an amazing purpose and role that schools are playing and have been playing in the past, but now also homework packets for kids who can't access them. And um, a lot of the, the teaching structures and the schedules and the lesson plans really aren't that much different from the way that they used to be. They're now just kind of in a different form uh, in a digital environment. And it's been a struggle. Um, I've been doing a lot of work um, or I've been doing a, a lot of facilitation with conversations from school leaders from around the world. Um, I was, I've been doing one every Thursday morning, in fact, for over 100 international school leaders. And, and what they're reporting out at this point is just a lot of exhaustion, a lot of like trying to figure out how can we keep doing this um, in terms of you know, not losing a lot of what the content and a lot of the curriculum, but yet keeping kids engaged and keeping kids um, on task and whatever else. So it's been a very kind of difficult and, and uh, um, uh, frustrating road for many to try to maintain this presence of school, even though kids aren't in school. Now, I want everyone to know that, uh, and you probably know this also, uh, kids are learning. There is online learning happening, but it just may not be the learning that we want them to be doing. And I'm going to show you just a couple examples. This is my son who's home from Colgate University. He's been home for the past three weeks, and uh, it's been fun to have him here. But um, what's been interesting is that he's decided he's taking his online classes. I mean, he has class, quote unquote, where he sits in Zoom sessions and he interacts and he does the work and writes the papers. But where he's been spending most of his time is coming up with um, his first podcast, and he launched it yesterday. It's about basketball. He's a basketball player. And I have to say, I'm, it's pretty amazing, um, as I was listening to it, how much he is learning and has learned about this thing that he is extremely passionate about, and that is sports and basketball. And um, that's really mo most of the learning that he's doing at home is this kind of self-chosen, self-directed learning that most kids, I think, are partaking of um, when they have a chance to do that. If, again, if they have the access, and, and like Stephen said, I think it is a huge, huge um, problem for those children right now who don't have regular access and who don't have the technologies that will allow them to learn in these types of environments. Um, I don't know if you've seen the articles, but a lot of college kids actually are recreating their college campuses in Minecraft so that they can hold graduation there because they're not gonna be able to do it in face-to-face -face worlds. And I just love these types of stories of kids just being creative and taking initiative and, and doing these types of things on their own. And I think that it speaks to this kind of 
unpleasant truth that we've always kind of known about schools. And I write about unpleasant truths a lot, but the one that I think is most acute is that, you know, schools don't really equal learning. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens in schools that really doesn't constitute learning. A lot of stuff where kids learn it for the test. And then as soon as the test is over, they unlearn it, they let it go. It doesn't matter to them, it's not relevant to them. And the only reason they quote unquote learn it is because basically they have to. So um, one of the things that has gotten me through this crisis is the site McSweeney's. I don't know if any of you are familiar with McSweeney's but it's a, it's a whole bunch of satire, it's really done well. And this was my favorite, the title of this one was, we the hardworking newly homeschooling parents of America have rewritten the common core standards. And so basically, if you go down here, it's just, you know, it, it's just poking fun at a lot of those kinds of truths that we kind of deal with. And here's my favorite in the domain of study skills and learning habits, grade nine through 12, three A is that students will learn that their parents do not remember anything they learned in high school, not a single thing. Um, and, and also, they will also learn, if you see their three C, that the SATs might not matter as much as we thought they did. Um, and a whole bunch of those things, I think, are, are pretty much coming to the fore as we look now at the types of learning experiences the kids are having and how really difficult it is to continue curricular learning in these other spaces. The question that I've been asking for about the last six or seven years around the world, as I presented to literally hundreds of thousands of people, I'll always ask them, what are the conditions for deep and powerful learning to happen? What is it that we, we require to really learn deeply? And it's been astounding, the consistency of the answers that I've gotten. Everyone says that for deep and powerful learning to happen, you have to have a safe learning environment. It has to have real world application. It has to have relevance. It has to have a real audience. There has to be passion. It's not constrained. It's, it's flow. And no one disagrees with any of these. When you see this list, everyone kind of nods their heads. And I want you to do a gut check right now at this particular moment, in this particular session, how many of those conditions exist for you? You're here because you have agency. You chose to be here. You chose to engage in these presentations and there's a real purpose for it. It's a re there's relevance or you wouldn't be here. Um, Stephen asking what you're drinking and whether you're wearing socks, there's an element of fun to it, right? Then, and, and so these conditions exist no matter where we are in terms of when we learn most powerfully and deeply. But here's what people never ever say when I ask that question, what are the conditions required for deep and powerful learning to happen? No one ever says any of these things, never in six years, no one has ever said any of these things. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about these conditions in your face-to-face -face world or in an online environment. If you're recreating these conditions in an online environment, you're not creating conditions for learning to happen at a deep level. And this is an unpleasant truth that I don't think we've, well, I, I don't think we've struggled with enough, but now I think we are being forced to struggle with that. Because the question now is, in a world of real uncertainty and really fast change, which of those two lists do you think is going to serve your kids best? Which of those two lists is going to help them thrive in the type of environment and a type of future that I think we all know is coming at us? So this moment, in some very interesting ways, is forcing us to identify what we really value about schools. And I think it's very interesting what we're choosing to undo about schools. We are undoing IB exams. We are undoing grades. We are undoing the idea that you have to get the full curriculum. Traditional AP tests are out, seat time, schedules. So many of the traditional structures and so many of the traditional practices that we have in schools, we are choosing to undo those things. And basically, um, it begs the question, what are you gonna keep undoing once this is over? What is going to be on your to undo list? What of that stuff that you're currently setting aside will you bring back? Or what of it will you look at and say, why were we doing that in the first place? Why were we doing a lot of the things that basically now we've been forced not to do? And that's one of the most important questions I think um, it, that we can be asking moving forward. So we are in serious learning mode right now. There is no question. We are learning our way through this crisis. And on some level, that's really powerful and it's extremely profound. And it does, I think, um, it, it mean that we're gonna have to ask 
all sorts of big questions. Just one little piece of promotion. If you go to bigquestions.institute, my colleague Homa Tavanger and I are, are doing a lot of this work in terms of what are the questions that people need to be asking right now and how can they ask them in ways that will lead them to maybe a different way of thinking about schools afterwards. But I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna give you four questions that I think, I'll leave you with four questions that I think are really, really important right now. First one is, how do you define learning? What is it? And how have you shared that definition and articulated and most uh, articulated it? And most importantly, how are you living it? How, if you observe what's happening in your online school or face-to-face -face school, what does that speak to in terms of what you believe about how learning happens? Do you really believe that learning happens when kids are age grouped, sitting in rows, timed, graded, all that kind of stuff? Do you really believe that those are the best conditions for learning? Second one is, what are you learning? about learning right now? How are you learning based on your own um, process through this moment, your own way of, of kind of dealing with this? And what about your teachers? How are they, what are they learning about their, their craft and their practice? And what are your students learning? And are you asking them? Are you talking to them? Are you getting meta with them? I think that that's a really important thing to do right now is to have these conversations about learning and ask them what's different, what's working, what's not working. What are the values and systems and structures that matter most right now? What are the things that you are choosing to do and prioritizing with kids? And why are you prioritizing those things? How does that speak to, the again, the things that you value and the ways that you look at your purpose in the world? And finally, how are you personally learning into the future? You know, this is the most amazing time to be a learner, I think, in history. And so who are you reading? And how are you connecting with people? And what are you creating and sharing as well? How are you sharing the learning that you're doing into the world? I think those are some of the really important questions that um, are going to be very important to ask because I know and you know that when we get through this, the pull is going to be to go back to where we were because it's easier, because we know it, because we can function in it. But I'm gonna suggest to you that normal is not, is kind of going away. And I think that we may be on the verge, not of the new normal, but of the no normal, where basically things change so quickly and there's very little to anchor to that um, it's going to be uh, difficult for us to simply continue the practices that we've used in the past in order to create kids who can thrive in the future. So I'll leave you with this quote, in a volatile world, rigid equals brittle and institutions that can't figure out how to work differently may not work at all. And so I hope that when you get a chance to breathe, that you will figure out how to work differently because as difficult as this moment is, I think that is the opportunity that it presents. And that's the opportunity that I hope all of us have a chance to, to seize. So thanks so much for giving me the time. I uh, really appreciate it. And Stephen, I'll send it back to you. Okay, well, thank you, Will. That was fantastic. I've uh, below the camera level here been taking some photographs of the screens and actually writing down a few notes. I think some some really really great questions there for everyone to sort of start thinking through. And I I know that uh, you know when, when people do meet, whether it's in a virtual context or whether they're still meeting in their schools, as has happening in some countries around the world without the kids. Um, these are the questions that have to be asked. Yeah, I, I love that idea that we're actually in an in-between time as well, because um, th that resonates with me. If you think about some of the the literature from C.S. Lewis and the the wood between the worlds that he talks about in in his first um, first of the Narnia series as well, that, that we're in that space and time we we don't actually know what it's going to look like at the other end. Yeah. All right, we will uh, we'll come back to you. I'm sure there'll be some questions that will be directed your way, but thank you so much for that. And we're gonna shift now across to snowbound Iceland and uh, Sigurdug, uh, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing your name again, sorry, and Osta, um, who are in Reykjavik. And uh, I invited them, I met, I met Sigurdug about 15 years ago now, uh, when I was uh, investigating online learning back in 2005 and um, that part of that journey took me to Iceland as a country that was already looking at what could online learning look like uh, as a as a component of the schooling offering at the time. And if we think about that, that, that was 15 years ago. And 
I guess for those people who've been thrown into the online world in the last month, um, it's actually very, very helpful for us to hear from people who have been in this space now for, for almost two decades as well. And I know that um, back in 2005, there were some new schools being built uh, in some of the regional areas of Iceland and they were being built around a, um, a blended learning or a fully online or a fully face-to-face uh, -face mode as well and so with some very, very interesting outcomes. So yeah, so welcome to uh, both of you guys. It's still morning in Iceland and, uh, yeah. I, and I, I guess, yeah, from, from my perspective, I think it's really, really helpful to have some people who are in a context where, yes, they've been in a school that's been offering online. And I know that um, the Commercial College of Iceland also has face-to-face -face, and so does the Vers Luna Scholli has face-to-face -face students as well. But we're, we're talking about the online component mm -hmm. today. Some of the lessons that you can sort of share with other people um, as a result of that journey over a far longer period of time. And then also, uh, I guess it's it's important to think through many people are in a context still where they are required to teach a mandated curriculum and the schools that uh, you, you've been involved with are doing just that so that they've they've looked at how might the mandated curriculum um, be delivered in an online context. So we uh, we thank you for both being involved today. And I, I thought I'd, I'd kick off um, with just asking the question, that um, you know, what what over the time over the time that you've been involved in the the f more formal online schooling context, what are some of the biggest challenges in relation to the students? Well, if I can start, then I think that the most important thing for us is to have the the structure of the courses very clear. The student they must know exactly what to do and when to do it. And we do that with the things they are supposed to read and listen to or what and what assignments to give and when and so on. And the, the teacher must inspire the students to do it and keep them working. All right. Well, that 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 word inspire is a, a good word and a challenging word. Ulster, um, what are some of the ways that you've learnt to inspire kids in that online environment? I think uh, the most important thing is that the students they know I'm there for them, that they're not lost somewhere inside the space. So what I do is um, I have this. What should I say? On going conversation between myself and the students. Um, as Silo said, it's important to, uh, the structure of the course is really important. And when they, when they open the door, I'm there for them, that they, they can feel that I'm there to help you, help them, support them, encourage them. I do that, for example, um, tiny things like using colors and pictures. And we like to greet them with a picture of ourselves or a video so they can see who I am and I'm there. Um, so I, I think it's important to guide them. I look at myself as a guide and I tell them which steps to take. Sigler sometimes talk about, talks about the guide who holds the map and the students stay. Uh, they know, you know, if they follow the guide, they, they are safe. Um, it's, uh, for example, feedback, uh, to give them feedback when, when they're doing something, whatever it is, to give them feedback. And it could be written or it could be a short video with, where I say, you know, this was great, you did this really well. Uh, and but you maybe you should look at these things better. They feel that, that I'm there for them if they see me online or or offline. So Alsta, how did you then relearn the role of being a guide um, away from a teacher that was sort of used to delivering content? Was that something that, that a journey that you were able to undertake by yourself? Was it a, a mental journey, a, a physical journey, an emotional journey? How did you reinvent 
yourself to be able to be that guide rather than the uh, person out the front? I think I had I had already done that during day school, so <laughs> um, I prefer methods. Uh, what should I say? Student centered methods, and I prefer to give students uh, choices. You know, listen to their voice. Uh, so student autonomy has been something I've been interested in for many many years. So I took that from my from my teaching into the distance learning, or I'm trying to do that. Okay, okay. I mean, the, the, uh, the trying to do that is an interesting notion as well. And I, I guess <laughs> another question for, for either of you to answer is that when you think back over the time that you've been working in the distance uh, online environment, what, what are some of the, the biggest challenges for teachers that sort of um, resurface with regularity? I think that the, the best teacher in the classroom, in the day school, the teacher that can connect to the students and can, in a way, perform in the classroom, he is also the best teacher online. He, he has, you know, he can connect with the students. He knows how to be visible in the online environment. Okay, now here's a question for you because I don't know the answer in the Icelandic system. Do teacher trainees get taught sort of relational skills as a part of their training or is that something that's just expected to get picked up in life? No, they are taught. Today they are. Uh, it hasn't been for a long time, but they are today. Uh, but that's, not, that's very not, encouraging to hear. Yeah. yeah, but not as much as I would like, but still. They are. Because it, it seems to me that um, when we're talking about the, the virtual environment and the fact that we don't want kids to feel alone in cyberspace is that the ability of, uh, of anyone to connect with, with, uh, with trust as well is a challenge. And I know that some of the pre-questions we got before this, uh, this event were about how, to, how do you establish trust with the, uh, with the students, with the learners. I might throw that question out just to, for you to think through. H how is trust developed when you actually don't meet the kids? Um, I think uh, trust is developed through uh, the connection that you have by the feedback you give to children or, or kids or adults, whoever is the learner. And um, I think it is this ongoing conversation between uh, the teacher and the student is really important that uh, it's going on throughout the course. There is always something. The teacher is uh, constantly doing something that links him uh, or making this link between the student and the teacher. It could be uh, feedback, it could be a short video, it is like when they open, for example, in, in some cases, we divide uh, the course into 10 weeks. So when um, a new week opens or a new module, then you greet uh, the students, you tell them what to expect. And um, my experience is that students often apologize when they ask a question. So uh, I'm not sure why this is. So I have been, you know, being really um, asking or inviting questions and making clear how they can do that. Because they seem, well, they say it's as if they are, you know, doing something wrong if they ask a question. So it's like they have to be able to understand that I'm there for them. And by writing these short letters to them or making short videos uh, when each module opens, I think that's a, a part of the, of the game, you know. So even in that more formal context where you're pushing through a, a, um, a government mandated curriculum, that connection is obviously highly important. Um, okay, well, another question that's sort of reflecting back over the time, what would be some of the recurrent challenges that sort of happen every year? Things that you have to be prepared for and work your, work your way through that they don't ever seem to go away. 
um, apart from technology, <laughs> <laughs> then uh, I think uh, the biggest challenge is always is uh, recurring is uh, engaging the students. And how do you do that? How do you do it to get to do what they're supposed to be doing? And so, uh, so any any pointers on that? Any tips that you could think through? What what actually has worked well? Yes, um, it depends a little bit on what they're doing. But uh, if you have assigned field of uh, interest assignments, for example, or you have um, they, the, the students are allowed to dance a little bit within a frame. Uh, they have something to say, you know, they have a voice within the system and the assignment. It's more likely that they submit than if they have something like questions to answer from a tax or something. So something creative, something challenging, and something that gives them uh, freedom to a certain extent. That's All right. What, Anything from Sigalug that you, you would yeah. add to when that? I, when I hear the student, when he says, I felt the teacher was standing behind me, then I know the teacher is doing something right. Right. Okay. That, that sense of presence going through. Yeah. Um, all right. People talk about synchronous and asynchronous um, modes of learning as well. Which one, from your perspective, seems to be the better or is it just a blend of the two uh, how would you what, what, what comments could you make for those people who are trying to decide do they do they try and go for a synchronous approach where the class is all online at the one time or yeah you know, what, what what's the balance that you've seen naturally emerge in your work uh, i would say that a mixture of the two is the best way to go uh, and what my students have said as well uh, they want to have time to to do their to work on assignments and and to do the uh, whatever they are doing um, without having the teacher all the time. Um, it depends on what they're doing. But for uh, as an example, I've had uh, classes online classes with my students to explain something or to discuss something for discussion, would they uh, voice their opinion on something? So it's really useful for that. But then they say, leave me alone when it's time to write an essay or, or do a, an assignment. So I would say definitely a mixture of both. Going through. Um, Sigalug, would you, would you add anything to that? Well, I, I, I completely agree to us for now. <laughs> yes, I agree. Um, okay, look, there's some other areas which would be, I guess, very relevant to teachers now. People who have thrown themselves into this online world in the last two or three weeks have experienced um, exhaustion. Uh, I've read many tweets about people crying. Um, burnout is happening very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Again, what would be some of the, um, the lessons that you've learned in, return, in relation to avoiding teacher burnout in the the online environment and the online learning environment. Asta, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I think uh, one of the mistakes that many, if I can call it a mistake, or is that teachers make is they give students too many assignments and they. Uh, want to read all this all everything and it's impossible uh, I, I think you can sometimes give students assignments without uh, going thoroughly through them afterwards also it's important or uh, to decide when you are going to be working you know it's easy to spend the whole 16 hours a day when you have online classes but so it's just a decision you have to make. I spend so and so many hours a day and not much. I take the weekends off and I can't save the world. Uh, I do my best, but um, I, I don't have to be there all the time. Also, you could uh, make things easier by 
for example, making interactive exercises partly, which is maybe difficult uh, if people are supposed to voice their opinions on, on things or go their own ways, but it, it works together with the rest. So interactive exercises. And also keep in mind that you don't have to assess everything that each student does. They can contribute uh, to the learning uh, without being assessed. I think I think that's what um, a lot of teachers are struggling with. They uh, have too many assignments to mark. They are engulfed with uh, endless uh, assignments, and so. Yeah, I mean, that's a very, very interesting one as well, because I know that, um, again, I, I sent out a tweet today on that topic. The the challenge is that when you know that the kids in this new, um, not normal world are in very, very different, unique contexts, even within their own cities, you can't really compare any child now with another child because every every person's got a unique context and the whole grading system to me just seems to be essentially flawed from the you know from even thinking about the concept that you'd even want to do it because for for what purpose you know you, you can't possibly judge one child's um, worth uh, against another's in any in any sense now with what's just happened. Look, one, one last question before we leave you guys for, for now, and uh, we'll then look forward to having some more time with you in the question and answers. Um, just what would be the, the one big tip you'd give teachers who are struggling to adjust, people who, are, who would really not be in the online environment? They've been thrown into this world and they would really not be there. What would be the one thing that you would say to them to encourage them? I think Asta gave the main point that you have to structure your day. You have to be working when you're working and then you have to take your time off and do something to, to recapture your energy for the next day. Asta. Okay. Yes, Asta. I, think, I think that's uh, the most important thing is that uh, you're not there all the time. Uh, and also, um, this, as we've talked about, the structure is really important because uh, then if students know what to do and how to do it, then uh, it's easier for the teacher he, uh, who doesn't get as many questions, for example, to answer as many emails. Uh, so uh, structure is uh, really important and um, that it's really clear what is expected of the students. So I think that's... Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's an interesting point to finish on. I, I know that um, I was reading about Havergal uh, College in Toronto and Canada, and they have, they've structured in Wellness Wednesday, right into the middle of the week, a day when the, the kids can focus on their, their own connections, relationships they can plan for the rest of the week, and for the staff to then also have time to plan to think right in the middle. And I think that's one of the biggest things I'm seeing now is people are starting to put wellness, whether it's adults, whether it's kids, whether it's families, right into the core of the model. Because if we don't do that, it's just not going to last. It's going to become extremely hard. So thank you, guys. Um, we'll come back to you. But we're now going to thank switch you. across to Canterbury and, uh, and to Becky Parker. Hi, Becky. Hi. Um, now, Becky. You're, you're a person who's got amazing energy, okay. um, and, and you, I, I know that your passion for astrophysics and science is off the scale. You know, I think you're the one person that's got me to be um, concerned that I don't understand the, uh, the nature of ray, rays between the, the moon and the earth and that I need to learn these things. <laughs> You've done that for me in the past. Um, you're a person who has had a, a long-term involvement with the, the curriculum in the UK. Um, I, I know from having attended a lecture last year that you spoke at uh, 
in London at the, one of the universities there that you your answer to the problems was was to get rid of 50% of the curriculum and you made a really really interesting point that resonated with me that if if a physics teacher in the UK was to cover every topic that they were, they were supposed to cover they would only have one hour on a topic and how on earth can you go <laughs> deeply into topics in one hour uh, when you're talking about physics or astrophysics I guess that that challenged me to think through um, yeah, the, the, the congested curriculum and you've also um, already taken kids directly into science projects. You know that you've talked about taking kids across to Geneva and being involved in the Hadron Collider. I know that kids have been involved with NASA. You've been involved in getting uh, uh, computer chips up into into space and sending back data. Um, so you've already had an amazing um, opportunity to bring kids into the real world. Okay, so now we're into this new learning world of, of totally online space. How would you bring your passion? What, what, what ideas have you got for bringing that passion for science in your case into the kids' homes right now? Well, it strikes me that we've got this amazing opportunity because science is all around them and there are different interests and passions of young people and you can't tell me that what their sort of current you know experience in secondary schools in many secondary schools partly because the curriculum is so packed that experience of constantly having to learn the stuff and get the answers right for the mark scheme that's not what science is we now this have this opportunity where one of the key things I think we want to develop for young people is that science is for all of them in terms of, for example, understanding this, you know, the background about this virus, you know, our politicians keep saying the science. In fact, actually, you know, young people should be understanding how scientific opinions come about, but also they want to explore their curiosity, their interests, their um, ability, this sort of idea that um, I've got five eyes, which is involve, investigate, interest, something interdisciplinary, and then inform others. The idea that young people can actually hone in on a project, which is, say, something which might really grab them. Current climate is often something on climate change, and think about how they might input that into what happens in the what do we call the no normal world of the future which will said um we we really need to give young people opportunities to work with their families to do this there was one particular example where we ran um a uh pollution project where young people were actually monitoring pollution levels in their environment and we invited parents along to hear the students present and you wouldn't believe the parents said to us we've never talked about science around the tea you know around the supper table we've never had that opportunity to actually engage with something which the students are really getting passionate about I mean you wouldn't really say you know how was your revision to cram in what you need to know for physics that's not something you would discuss at home whereas you know why is the sky blue why are rainbows the way you know just get this window and seeing nature sort of emerging there are so many different areas and there are so many opportunities there are online science options you know there are um citizen science data sets and young people can seriously feel some ownership we want science to be where there aren't the answers at the back of the book, where yeah, but, 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 they but, Becky, are excited. Vicky, I'll throw in a challenge here. That, that this is not my thinking, but I guess this is, we hear this, this sort of thing um, said quite regularly. How do you know when the kids are involved in these passion projects that they're actually covering the core? I mean, what gives you the confidence to say that in this creative world, in this authentic world of research, that the kids are, are getting the core information that, that regrettably we've all been trained into thinking is important? Well, I think for one thing, that core should be limited because um, you never take stuff out of the curriculum. You always add stuff in. And so the current, say, GCSE science in the UK is so packed that many schools 
find it a struggle to actually finish the curriculum. Well, that's not what science education is. Cramming and cutting out practical activities because they're having to get so much material in. In examples which I've run, where students, as you say, put um, a small experiment up on a satellite, they, uh, and they did this and they, you know, have written papers on this. Of course, they learned what was necessary because they had to understand circular motion, radiation. They had to teach themselves. I mean, it was necessary to learn the things to be able to make a contribution. And as a teacher, it was invigorating for me because I didn't know, you know, people say, what's the answer to this, Miss? And I'd say, I don't know, we need to work this out. And that's quite scary. I and mean, in, in lots of ways, it's easier to actually do what you do and know what you're having to deliver. Well, that's not what real education Einstein said. Education is what remains after you've forgotten everything you've learned at school. And, and I think that's probably coming to the fore where parents are trying to help young people in the sort of standard science activities because they may have forgotten that. They may have only remembered extra things which shouldn't be extra, should be actually the core of what we do, extra things which you're able to inspire and excite and make all well, give young people confidence and give young co people confidence that it's not just an outside world that they have to sort of deliver, you know, they have to understand. I mean, I know in science we have to understand our basics and we can make sure that happens. And, you know, the internet gives and textbooks that things will give you extra stuff if you need it but you're not telling me you're ever going to be able to teach them enough because science is changing every day so okay well then if we, if we take that notion that's people are about to have an easter break the schools come back at the end of that time what what's a key question that school teachers school leadership have to be asking themselves right now they've they've gone through two or three weeks of this changed world they've in many cases now having a few, at least a few days off over easter when the schools come back again after that break what do you think is a key question a school should be asking of itself as they think about how to move forward into the next next term well i think they should think we are so lucky to have this space where actually we don't have to cram kids for exams because all the exams are cancelled. What actually would young people feel as though was something appropriate in a sense to make up? You know, they've spent a lot of their lives getting ready for these exams. We don't want them to feel disillusioned that now they've got a stretch of time. What really could we do where young people can explore areas which they can really have a, a, a commitment and interest a passion for themselves can they contribute to what might be the new normal afterwards can they put I mean, after all this new world is their future and it's their world I think we often don't give enough respect to our young people because we just assume that they have to learn exactly as we've always learned you know not much has changed really in the curriculum I mean there are obviously interesting ways of doing things and everything but in terms of content can't we now think what would really inspire young people how could we bring together what young people want as their future how can we give them the tools to really do this rigorously I'm not for anything you know learning some you know discovering something just for the sake of it I'm not into that lack of rigor I want young people to say if they're interested in the climate to go on the climate interactive um, whole system which MIT has developed where they can understand how different changes to the system might result in different temperature rises and how okay, well, different let, worlds just... might then. So I want young people to do something which they feel is valuable for them okay. and for their future population, for their future okay, so life, for their world. You're talking about the kids doing things, which is really, really important. What about the teachers who have um, not experienced the creativity in the classroom specifically beforehand and are now thinking how do I how on earth do I dive into a more creative approach 
in the online world. Now, I know that you've been um, fundamental in establishing IRIS in the UK, which is sort of all about authentic science projects. How might teachers gain the confidence without months of professional development to, to launch into more creative ways in these areas that you're talking about? I think they can do that if they're given support. I think there are a number of teachers who love this approach because it feels like they're reconnecting with their passion. You know, often in science, as a science teacher, you're not being a scientist in the way that you might be a musician if you're a music teacher. And many people who love science actually want to rekindle that. And I think that people mustn't feel on their own because I think it is scary. And the general thing is that teachers should know the answer and that they should be able to, you know, you know, you know, transfer what's in their head into the mind of the student. Well, we need to get away from that. And if, if science teachers work together and help each other, you know, there's a phenomenal teacher up in Sheffield who just inspires his classes, Nick Harris at Tapton School. And, and he does that and he's sort of infected in a positive way the whole department with this enthusiasm and this reconnection back to what is uh, a, a really good science education and it also is a realistic science education because it will definitely prepare young people for being able to cope with the future and university should they go on into science so I think we should try and be more connected and not so feeling that the teacher, you know, I think th there should be a thing where teachers can share tips of coping with this and there shouldn't be any black mark on somebody who says, well, I don't know that answer, I need to look it up. Because actually, if you are going to be really allowing young people to look into different topics, of course you won't know. But that's what's exciting about teaching. We, as Will said, we should always be learning. And I want young, I want te really want people to think that teaching is about that for science, which I think often people don't go into science teaching because they think that, you know, that's like the barriers up, but actually the barriers should be open. It should be an amazing opportunity to learn with your students, a bit like Sagata Mitra says, you know, being like the grandmother, chipping them along and, and helping is exactly as Asta says, you know, being there for them. And I think I, I agree entirely that one of the things is you just get overwhelmed and you get too many inquiries, too much interest, and you have to be controlled about that. But I think we can help each other do that. And we should be more collegiate to support teachers, to give them the confidence that they can do that. And that's an authentic way of being a science teacher. Okay, so then let's think about the other end of the pandemic. Um, what should a politician be thinking about right now? What, what message would you give to the government that you think is really important as we move ahead at this point in time? Well, I would say that they have taken a very easy way of thinking that they are assessing young people with tests. And in situations like this where they can't happen you know everybody's sort of thinking "Ooh," whereas actually we should take a more challenging way of assessing young people which isn't just you know whether you answer whether you've crammed a revision guide and whether you answer a tick box thing correctly it should be far more finding ways where you trust teachers to enable young people to learn in a way which maintains their curiosity, allows them to contribute, gives them advocacy, enables them to be included, and that that's going to be tough to have rigorous assessment methods like that. But I think in order to respect young people, we need to develop those assessment mechanisms which people have confidence in. Uh, and I think we should think, we may have got this whole sort of nightmare stress of exams completely 
as the wrong focus. We need to reorder and allow young people to do things where they can really gain this curiosity, learn lots of stuff. I'm not against learning the basic science so that they can jump off and be passionate scientists as part of everybody's life, not just those who go on to be scientists. I think if we can get a better science education, we'll have a better understanding about potential other threats like this in the future. And so I would say that the politicians need to take a long, hard look at these assessment structures because they're not fit for purpose and they're not fit to allow young people to really show what they can do and allow them to flourish rather than constrain them. Okay, so then just as we finish off uh, for, for now, um, if you had a message for parents and a message for students right at this point in time, are their kids going to suddenly suffer for the rest of their life because of this, uh, this in-between world that the kids have been thrown into? No, I would have thought if they can both get this right and they cannot get sort of panicked about what if we fall behind, that's falling behind on this very strict set of things. You know, things can always be caught up in terms of, you know, can you do long division or, you know, those sort of standard things you don't want to miss out at certain points. But I think what, what I would want to say is think about what education is. Think about the chance for your families to actually learn together to reconnect with some particular thing which is of interest can you work together to perhaps explore something which you've never asked before about your garden your house your universe you live in the skies at night the smallest things in the world and the largest things in the universe can you take this opportunity to not think oh I haven't done this assignment I haven't done this piece of work I haven't done this exam paper can you actually stop and think what is education really for it's about reigniting this curiosity about the world and looking at that together and using this opportunity to stop and actually think you know, I remember that the most significant things I remember from my schooling is these amazing projects I did in primary school where I did a whole math thing all about Venn diagrams and I did a thing, you know, uh, observing uh, this hawthorn tree over a whole year. And those things I actually remember. Whereas actually I don't remember anything I did at my secondary school. And what about those sorts of really resonating things? We need to make education not just about what you do at school education is the whole learning and the whole inspiration about the world and the curiosity in science I think which young people okay. have which they somehow get kicked out of often at school we need to rekindle that with parents so that together they can actually find a love of questions about science and really interrogate this more now that, that, that point that you've just made is a perfect segue into our next conversation with Matt um, for a couple of reasons. When I was doing my <laughs> pre-event chat with Matt, he talked about the fact that uh, he had the afternoon duty with his kids and took them out into the garden and they discovered things buried underneath the soil. So we, we'll come back to you, Becky, with the quick Q&A afterwards. Thank you very much for that passionate uh, and, and so many ideas there. And we're going to move now to Matt uh, in Sydney. Matt, um, some people know you very, very well, and many don't. But I, I, you've sold over a million books worldwide, um, all focused on uh, on kids and uh, and I guess ultimately creativity as well. Perhaps you could just uh, share a little bit about yourself and that journey and your family in terms of um, who you are and what what's your passion there. Sure. Well, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, this is really wonderful. I'm really enjoying it. Um, 
this is not a space that I'm in a lot because um, I'm the odd one out here, I guess. I'm not a teacher. Um, in And so I'm married to a teacher. Uh, Beck, my wife, is a primary school teacher. Um, so I'm an author and an illustrator. I create uh, children's books uh, from picture books through to chapter books, mostly for kind of primary school age kids. Um, uh, we're based here in, in Sydney, Australia. We run our own company. Uh, and then most of our books are published by HarperCollins here in Australia and then other publishers around the world. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, we, 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 we create a lot of books where we're, um, we kind of do eight to 10 books a year. And, uh, and our, my pathway to this has been not through, not through education at all. This is something that I wanted to do since I was very small and uh, and I've come this way, I've come to, to book creation via um, graphic design and art direction. Uh, my wife, Beck, uh, is, we, we create books together. Uh, and so she's come here uh, via primary education. And, uh, and so that's been a really kind of wonderful space together. Um, and then I guess the other aspect of what uh, of what we're doing and, and possibly what's a little bit more relevant to this conversation is, uh, is the way that I'm using YouTube at the moment to, to connect with, to connect with kids, uh, or to connect with, with learners or, or anyone who's particularly interested in, uh, in kind of the creative work that we're, that we're doing. So, yeah, so creativity is a big part of your world. And, uh, I, I've heard, um, a couple of times where I think it was Beck was reading out one of the books, um, the uh, the one about the uh, the bull and the box, the, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. That's, I just loved hearing hundreds of kids screaming out, you know, that's not a bull. <laughs> it, it, it's uh, it, the 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 books that you're writing are, are are highly creative, and they really really get young kids uh, totally frustrated in a positive way, and and engaged with the characters and and the humor as well. So creativity is a big part of your of your world. What, what drives you as people think about creativity now being such an important skill as we move forward in the world? What drives you in that way? So, uh, so I feel really passionate. If you want to ask like what my why is, like what, why, do, why do I do this and, 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 and what kind of drives us? It's, it's, it's the belief that we really need creatively confident kids um, to engage the challenges in our world, um, and uh, and I, I spent a lot of time in schools, visiting schools, and and we can talk more about that. But um, but yeah, it's that it's that creative confidence that uh, that I really want to inspire in kids and encourage um, their belief in their own creativity. Um, I guess I, I work in books because um, because by encouraging kids to develop a love of reading, especially really early, and 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 we've got picture books that, that you would read with a child from kind of the age of two. And we're actually developing a baby book series at the moment uh, through to kind of chapter books for upper primary. Um, I think books have a really unique uh, opportunity in, in starting that into creativity and inspiring that uh, in kids because um, books activate the imagination. Uh, you have to use your imagination when you're reading in a, in a in a different way and in a more kind of uh, engaged way than when you watch TV or play games or uh, or listen to music or or kind of other forms of uh, entertainment that that kids might engage with, and so so you're kind of activating their imagination as they're as they're empathising with characters as they're putting themselves in someone else's shoes, they're uh, discovering other parts of the world through what they're reading. Uh, or different ways of thinking, and so and and when you kind of kickstart that imagination, the imagination is that first step to creativity. Um, once once you can imagine something that doesn't exist yet, well, the next step is, well, can I create that thing that that doesn't exist yet? Um, but I, and it's I, I creative. You, sorry, I didn't say. I, I know that you made some very interesting observations though about creativity and imagination when you visited schools. Um, what are some of the, some of those observations? Because I think they they're a little bit worrying when I when I heard what you were what you were seeing. 
Yeah. So, um, so this has been really interesting. I, I kind of spend uh, five to six weeks of the year in school. So kind of a different school every day. Uh, I'll do five, six, seven sessions across a day uh, with, with students from kind of pre-K, so four or five-year-olds all the way up to stage three, so uh, 11, 12-year-olds. And, uh, and we'll talk about creativity. We'll do various kind of imagination exercises. We'll draw, we'll, we'll tell stories. Um, and one of the things that I, I've noticed two things, primarily I've, I've kind of been thinking about them in the last 12 months or so. The first is that, um, and this is all just experiential for me, but uh, that, that kids seem to be losing their creative confidence the older they get. So those younger grades, those younger uh, students uh, seem a lot more free to throw out ideas when you kind of, you present a, a story starter and then you, uh, and then you, you, you ask the, the kids for, for responses and ideas. You get a lot more the younger that they are and, uh, and they start to kind of lose some of that creative confidence, um, which if you follow that all the way through, I mean, how many adults do we know who will, happily throw out the sentence I'm not creative um, and uh, and so so that trajectory worries me um, and the second thing which I think um, I've found really interesting to think about is is I'll, I'll visit a quite a wide spectrum of schools so some quite affluent private schools uh, through to more socioeconomic lower socioeconomic schools and um, and one of the things I've found really interesting is if you go into a school where that, uh, oh, sorry, when I've gone into a school where their academic standards are really high, um, uh, there's a really strong focus on education and these kids have really learnt how to do school, right? Um, well, the benefits you get from that as a presenter are you come in and, uh, and they're really good at sitting quietly, uh, they're really attentive, they don't talk uh, to each other and uh, that's kind of easy as a presenter. Um, but when you get to questions that kind of want to, you want to draw their creativity out, it's really hard work. Whereas where, when I go to a, a lower socioeconomic school where the students aren't as kind of as good at doing school, um, sure, the room is harder to manage and, uh, and there's calling out and there's all of that sort of stuff, which I quite like. Um, but there's a lot more freedom in creativity. And so I've been trying to kind of process what is that? What is that about? And and okay, well, perhaps on that point, that's that's where I can draw these threads together now. So we're we're okay. talking about remote and home based learning uh, as our theme for tonight. Yeah. How how would you see, um, as a person who's not a teacher, what are mm. your thoughts about um, how do we immerse kids in creativity in this opportunity that we have now, where where we've got remote or home based learning happening? Well, I think, I think there's a real opportunity here because, um, because the, the conclusion that I've come to in, in, in the last year or so spending time in schools has been that fear of failure is a killer for creativity. If you are worried about getting it wrong, uh, then, um, then you're, you're less creatively free. And so uh, the kind of the, the more kind of in tune students are with like, with, with how they have to succeed at school, the more paranoid they are about getting it wrong. Um, whereas if we step out of that environment, particularly into an online environment, um, then, then we can kind of start to step away from that. This is gonna be assessed. What do I need to do to tick all the boxes kind of way of thinking. And so, um, so what I've been doing a lot uh, on YouTube is um, is trying to engage kids on an, or, or learners of any age really at a at an interest based level. So so what I can do here, this is my studio. It's in my it's at, it's at my house, um, and so I on YouTube. Uh, I've, I've been doing YouTube stuff for a couple of years, but since this kind of COVID nineteen. Um, weird period that we're in I, I every day so I'm making a video every day so I'm inviting 
anybody who's interested, but mostly students or kids who read my books, um, into my studio every day. And, um, and so I'm able to create online content that sits there on YouTube um, that, that is interest-based. Uh, and so I, because there's no curriculum, there's no kind of, there's no assessment, it has to be interest-based. I must draw their attention and I need to hold their attention. Um, we've, you know, we've talked a lot uh, so far about inspiration and inspiring them. I need to do that in order to engage them because otherwise they'll go watch something else. Um, I'm also thinking about kind of the open age nature of, of the content that I'm producing. So when I'm making uh, video content to go online, then I don't really know the age of the, of the learners that I might be talking to. And, um, and given that I kind of have a, I'm quite passionate about the thing, the feeling that I think we talk down to kids a lot anyway, um, and don't give them enough credit. Um, so how can I create uh, content that is um, that is interesting, uh, regardless of your age. So, for example, um, I I created a video the other day um, about how to draw. Um, there's a cartoon character here in Australia called Bluey, who is a is a blue healer dog, and it's quite popular here in Australia at the moment. And so I created a, a, a how to draw Bluey video, um, but I. Like if you're if you're a younger learner, then then you just want to copy what I'm doing potentially on screen. You want to copy how I draw Bluey, but actually the way that I learnt to cartoon, the way that I learnt to draw was to learn as a kid was to learn how to draw my favourite characters. And there's a method to that. Like how do you deconstruct a character's shapes and reconstruct them in your own drawing? And so I I made the drawing lesson of how to draw Bluey an exercise in how to deconstruct and understand the shapes. And that therefore I think becomes accessible to anybody wanting to learn about how to draw cartoon characters, uh, whether you're an adult or whether you're six. Um, and so, and then I think the other thing that is, is super interesting about, about this kind of moment that we're in, in an online space is the opportunity for learners to, to learn from practitioners. So to learn from people who are, who are doing the thing that they're interested in. Um, and so um, one of, the, one of the, um, the benefits of going into a school, for example, which I do, is that you instantly start to demystify the process for kids. The, the idea that there is someone behind the books that they read. Um, there is someone who used their imagination uh, for their work to create the book that they hold in their hand. And, and so the idea of taking that, which, it, which happens in this kind of really contained environment of a, of a classroom, I can now open that right up. And so, um, so here I am. Um, and one of the things that I'm doing in these kind of daily videos is I'm, I'm creating a book right now and I'm taking the kids through the process. So I'm talking about writer's block as I have it. I'm talking about story structure as I work out story structure. Um, I'm talking about dialogue as I write dialogue. And, and at the end of the process, the kids can read the book um, and they can see what I was creating. So the opportunity to kind of use this online space um, for, uh, for people who are, who are, are working in various fields uh, to, to really open that up and invite um, learners in, I think is quite exciting. So, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing from you now um, from a non-teacher's perspective that this creative space is really, really important. And, and uh, I mean, that's an interesting challenge for teachers. To, and it's also a solution in some ways, rather than having to over-program a day, that the open-ended, um, interest-based, open-age approach is actually very powerful in terms of creativity. And that probably within the community of parents or the community of the school already, there are a lot of people who are a resource potentially. Just, just as we finish up now, before we get to the Q&A, you're, you're a parent and put your parent hat on at the moment. Um, mm. it, I, I think what, what's been helpful hearing from you is that um, the learning, the context for what we're talking about when we're talking about learning should be far broader. It should be, it should be far, far more um, less constructed and far more open-ended. 
Now, as a parent, put the hat on, what, what are you learning as a parent at the other end of this remote learning phase? And, and I guess this, we'll finish up with this, that, sure. this little area. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, a seven-year-old daughter. Uh, we've got a four-year-old son. Uh, we've also got a two-year-old. Um, and so, uh, so we have material coming home from the school, from local school. Uh, which is mostly worksheets and things like that. And so, uh, so we try to do a little bit of, of writing and a little bit of uh, mathematics in the morning, which is mostly what's coming home from school. Um, but then what we've been trying to do is, is really open up our afternoons. And, uh, and as you mentioned before, uh, getting the kids out in the garden. Um, I, I've been really enjoying it actually as a parent because I've realized that so much of the time when my daughter is going off to school, I'm, I'm compartmentalizing her education in my head in that that happens at school. Uh, and instantly I'm deeply engaged in it. And, uh, and, and so I'm thinking a lot more actively about the kinds of conversations we're having. So we're digging in the garden, we're building a new veggie patch um, we've only been in this house a year where we're still learning this house. So, uh, so we're digging down and we discover there's an old garden edge wall under the ground, uh, that we need to remove. And, and so now we're talking about archeology span and we're talking about Pompeii and, uh, and the kids are asking questions and we're kind of exploring that. We did a like sensory walk around the garden. We talked about all of our different senses and, uh, and what we could find and what happens when you take this leaf and you scrunch it up and smell it. And uh, this afternoon, uh, the kids have been watching um, a Harry Potter, the first Harry Potter, and they had questions about, you know, does Harry really have an invisibility cloak? And so I found myself starting to explain to them, well, you know, there's tricks that they can do on the computer when they're making a movie. And then I thought, well, hang on, let's just go out into the backyard. And so we set the iPhone up, we made a video uh, I had them kind of step out from behind the sheet and then we brought the thing into iMovie we cut it together and we made them disappear. And uh, so it's stuff like that. It's, um, I think as a parent, it's been, it's been difficult. Like it's been stretching, that's for sure. Um, there's a bit of cabin fever and we're trying to kind of work our way around that. Um, it's been important to try and connect with other parents in the same space and make sure we're kind of supporting each other and realizing that, oh yeah, this day was rubbish and that's kind of normal. Um, but then also to, to recognize that so much of our kids or my daughter, particularly her experience of school so far is social and, and that that's, that's incredibly important, those social skills and those relationships that she's building. And so trying to prioritize time in the day to make sure she's, she's FaceTiming her friends as well and still trying to keep that alive. So it's, uh, I think it's really rich. Um, it's challenging, but it's rich. I mean, that, that's an interesting comment. I wonder whether schools should be intentionally focusing time now on developing parental skills at this time. You know, that if, if we're talking about planning programs for term two or for whatever else, whichever term it is in the world for the particular school system that, that perhaps as much focus should be going on ideas for parents because it sounds like from what you're saying there is that the opportunity for that rich family time whether you're in a house or whether you're in an apartment you now whatever your context is that it's uh we we need to be all learning and we schools probably haven't been focusing enough on empowering parents because if parents can take that level of leadership in the remote learning context well, then there's probably far more that could be achieved. Um, let, let's let's wrap up the presentations at this point. We've, I've got lots of questions have been sent through to me here. Um, so I, I'd, I'd love now just to sort of throw a few through and I'm going to throw the first one back to Will. Um, uh, so look, thank you for your insights. Uh, I guess I'm hoping that the, uh, the audience have actually appreciated that we've had people from very different perspectives um, on, on the one topic going through. One of the questions that came through very strongly um, before the event and also initially, Will, was how do we how do we talk to government? How do we talk to system leaders so that they don't regress? 
when this is all over? Yeah, <clears throat> well, it, it's a it's a difficult question. Um, you know, uh, the the reality of it is is that there are lots of people who are making lots of money on keeping the system as it is, and uh, those people spend their money on governments and politicians who keep the system <laughs> as it is. I mean, you look at the textbook companies, you look at technology companies, tutoring services, I mean, they're all heavily invested in school as we know it. So it's difficult to break that hold that I think in many cases is about money, but in, in a lot of cases too, or in a lot of aspects too, is simply about narrative, that this is what we know, again, this is what we experience. Um, you know, I, I am really inspired by mastery.org. I'll just go back to that example because what it shows is that there's strength in numbers. Um, Mastery, if, if, uh, if you haven't heard the story, um, but uh, when they started that, basically uh, Scott Looney, who is from uh, the Hawkins School outside of Cleveland, went to a college admissions officer and said, what if we send our kids to you without any numbers on the transcript? Because we think numbers are kind of stupid and that grades really don't show what kids can do. What if we changed the whole thing and made it more competency based? And that admissions officer basically said, well, yeah, sorry, but we probably won't, you know, really do much about that. But then he said, well, what if I get like two or 300 of my friends, my other headmasters to come and do that with me? And then they said, well, then we'll figure it out because we're not going to turn away really great kids from 300, 400, 500 different, different, uh, um, you know, schools. And I think that that's just a lesson in numbers, in strength in numbers. There are so many people who I think in their heart of hearts understand that a lot of what we do in schools doesn't make any common sense. And that a lot of what's happening in schools now is causing unhealthy levels of stress, of anxiety, our kids are hurting. And that if we rose up in some type of collective voice and said, no more, we have to reimagine this, then I do think we could put some pressure on politicians and governments to at least embrace some conversations around different narratives. But I am not, uh, you know, I'm totally realistic about the difficulty of doing that because these systems and traditions and narratives are deeply rooted in the way we think about schools and education. Um, and unless we can really come together in force in, in big numbers and with a somewhat, somewhat coherent voice, it's going to be very, very difficult to do. Yeah, it's interesting. Yong Xiao made the comment in my interview with him that our best argument possibly at this point is economic. You know, that the, the amount that will be saved within an economy if the traditional assessment structures are kept out um, can actually be helped, can, can go back towards... Um, I guess the country's economic recovery process. I mean, that was a sort of a side comment, but it's a, I think it's a it's a valuable point to be making to people as well. Okay, that related to that sort of um, question about governments and other ones. There's a number of questions have come through beforehand, and also there's some have come through on the, uh, the Twitter feed. What do we do about the digital divide? What do we do about? Because I've got friends who are watching this um, uh, event today from Rwanda. Now, what, what do you do when you've got the context where they're, 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 there's not the technology, there's not the, um, you know, where, where, the, where the community is, is already struggling in many ways? And uh, does, I guess we might just go through, through the, whole, the whole group here. It's, yeah. What possible answers can we come up with at this point? Well, I'll just be really brief, but one of the things that has been kind of inspiring is the fact that in many cases, at least here in the States, um, technology companies and, and governments are just breaking the bank to make sure that kids get access, um, free Wi-Fi at home, free laptops, that kind of thing. How we do that in remote areas of the world is a much, much different and much more difficult conversation, obviously. But um, I do think that over time, if we made it a priority, we could bridge most of that divide. But um, you're, there's no question that it's a serious, serious um, barrier for a lot of kids right now. Yeah, and I, I guess that point you just made that it hasn't been a priority and we've been caught out. I mean, and, and I guess we don't want the, um, you were talking about the, uh, the UN goals, sustainability goals and, and uh, we don't we don't want this whole component of the world to then simply be forgotten because they haven't got that access and any thoughts from everyone else about that digital divide uh, 
any creative ideas that you might have been thinking through. Not sure. Can I say something, Stephen? Yeah. Uh, I wonder, sort of, and it could affect the digital divide too, whether actually the student voice might be powerful if we can mobilise young people to feel they do have advocacy and, and a voice. That actually, as Will was saying, that, you know, these economic... Um, forces but actually you can see that young people can mobilize about things they feel really strongly about and if young people really start as talking to a student this morning about that whole climate interactives um, uh, website and the whole system there and they said oh I'd love to do this if young people realize that actually there are so many more opportunities will not young people themselves force this to change because they have got a huge voice they just haven't had a chance to share it so that's an interesting point because you've you've you're saying there that um in the context where there is that digital divide that possibly the starting point is to hear from the kids to say what do they want what would be useful for them yeah um Matt, Alsta, or Sigalug, do you have any, any other thoughts on that one? It's a, I know it's a very hard topic, that one. Um, only briefly, and, and, and that is that um, as this stuff, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the solution is, but, I, but as I think about this, I get really excited about, uh, about about as, as communities are connected, as they bridge this divide, um, the, the voices that we get to hear, the, the, the student voices that we get to hear. And, and even so, like from a creativity point of view, um, even looking at, at platforms like TikTok and things like that, 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 that kids are really starting to use and it, and it becomes this kind of sharing place of, of creativity. And, and there's some amazing stuff that comes out on, on a platform like that of kids from all around the world um, starting to, um, to, to express themselves creatively in really original ways. And, um, and I love the idea that there, are, uh, that there are pockets of the world that, that we haven't heard from a lot, but, but if we can bridge this divide, there are millions and millions of voices and creative voices that get to enter the conversation and and i i don't have ideas about how to do that yet but uh, but i'm excited for for how we solve it yep uh anything from iceland any thoughts on that one or just uh again it's a difficult task isn't it well i was just thinking about the words matt said Fear of failure is a killer of creativity. And I think that is a statement I will think very carefully about and use in my future work. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> okay, and I guess we, we can't afford to avoid the question about the digital divide simply because it's hard. Um, there are many questions in other areas and I might, I might shift the focus again for a second. One, one area that people are, are recurrently interested in because they're stuck is the area of wellness. Um, the wellness of, of the, the teachers, the wellness of the families and the wellness of the kids. We, we, might, um, we might look at those three different groups. What, what, what practical ideas or, or um, programs have you heard of that actually address that, that challenging issue of wellness for the, for the teachers? And I, I guess my, my first comment on that one then I'll, I'll throw in a bit of a comment on this one is that it schools have to look at the timetables of what what's going on uh, when it struck me that um you know if you've got two or three kids at home and schools are sending out a separate timetable for every child depending on that teacher's timetable you, you're overlaying three lots of stress onto a family and uh, it, it's, it's not sustainable, but let, let's focus first of all on the wellness of, of teachers. In any um, 
tips, thoughts, questions on that one. We might throw it back to Will to start with again. Well, I think uh, just in general, there there needs to be an articulation of uh, lowering the bar for all of this right now. Um, and I'll go back, you know, kind of what to, I think it was Becky that said, um, you know, uh, just teachers and kids have to stop worrying about getting behind and, you know, not being able to, uh, to you know, move forward with the learning that they're supposed to be doing. I, I, again, these are uh, hopefully, while well, they're not unique times, but they are very, very difficult times. And to expect us to continue to, you know, I've, I've heard stories, and Stephen, you told me the story too, of, of you know, that we're, we're actually asking kids to get in their school uniforms before they come on a Zoom session. Um, it's just ridiculous. And, and so um, to really just ratchet down the expectations that we have here. Uh, the, the most important expectation is, as you suggest, just the health and wellness of our teachers and, and students as we go through this. Um, that's the most important thing. Um, we can, you know, catch up on the stuff later, but for right now, uh, I think just taking as much as we can off the shoulders of teachers to, to push out and deliver curriculum and worksheets and packets and grading and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's just not, that's just not helpful in this moment when people are scared and fearful and exhausted and simply trying to manage their day-to-day -day lives. So. That would be my suggestion, just ease off. And um, there will come a time when we can revisit a lot of that stuff, but now is not the time to do that. Okay, I, I might throw in at this point, a, um, one of the suggestions that was put forward and it will be in Sarah Martin's supplementary video that uh, we made with Sarah, very, very helpful. At Stonefield School in Auckland and New Zealand, they've got a, uh, a model where they've got one third, one third, one third so that each day is divided up into thirds. Now, I th it, it, there was a really interesting comment from Sarah and you, people can hear it on her video, is that for one, you know, for a family, a child's engagement for one hour is success. You know, <laughs> for, another, for another family, it might be four hours, is that we, we probably need to move away from any sense of timetabling in the big picture to recognize that, that the contexts are all very, very different and we shouldn't judge a person or a child who's only managed to focus for an hour as saying that that's failure compared to someone else. And now within that one third, one third, one third model that the Stonefield School have put together is that one third is focused on, I guess, concept development. And it, it's not necessarily led by the teachers. It could also be um, you know, using uh, software tools or it could be, uh, it, it could be anywhere, you know, child directed as well. Um, one third is also on sort of uh, asynchronous projects and passion and interest projects and then one third is family time and I, I thought okay if, if we were to then start elevating in our understanding the family learning that's taking place whether it's around um, the meal table or however else and there was a, an, another idea got uh, thrown in I heard from um, the conversation with Alfredo uh, he talked of a family who were exploring the world per country. Now, what, what was interesting there was that the kids during the day would research into that into the country that they were looking at. And then for that family meal in the evening, they would cook food from that particular country. Now that, I mean, that's got 196 possibilities, hasn't it? If you, if you travel around the world in terms of the number of days that you could do that, a very simple idea. But again, I think the uh, you know, practical solution here is that if you can, if you can empower the families to see that those simple things could actually be incredibly helpful in the big picture because they're actually helping the, the teachers not feel the pressure of having to be there nine to five or however long they're, they're, they're in their um, scheduled, scheduled lessons. Um, so let, let, let's talk about the, the child, the students again, and a question has come up sort of on that wellness theme. What, what would it look like if students weren't failing and were successful in this remote world, <laughs> anyone would like to have a go at that one? What 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 could it look like if if students were thriving? Can I say something here, Stephen? Yeah. Yes. Well, I would like, and I know this is fairly sort of um, not that sophisticated, but as a start, students 
can become the presenters in class. You know, when you've got your online classroom, I, I'm hoping that for some of my groups, they are gonna come back and give short talks about the specific things they've been interested in. And they either have produced a short video or they'll have um, done a PowerPoint or some way of communicating their enthusiasm about what they've looked into for their peers. And I don't think we should even assess that. I think by doing that, that will have given them confidence in thinking about how they're going to present and then they'll learn more about how they communicate, how they share and explain ideas, um, how they become a sort of a, a more um, really deep learner because they've understood the topic they're trying to explain. So I think allowing young people to present themselves what they have done uh, and share their enthusiasm passion with the rest of the class is going to be fantastic for them and for teachers and for parents because no doubt they'll practice it on their parents and make you know get contributions from uh, different members of their family uh, uh, something like that seems quite manageable may not be that sophisticated but it's a start yeah, that, that's quite interesting. I know that within the Learn Life program, that the um, the point that everyone's been looking forward to every couple of weeks is what we what's called the open mic session. It's when the kids are actually uh, presenting back to the entire virtual community what they've been doing, whether it's a video, whether it's a song, whatever it is. It, it's that point of connection as well. And I guess as people are making comments here and we're, and we're seeing the questions, it seems to me that something is emerging that's important. And that is that if creativity is to grow, we have to allow time for it. If we, where does that time come from? Well, it, it, that time can actually help provide a, a solution to the problem of the teachers having to take total responsibility for the entire synchronous day so that if we can sort of say let, let's bring in a creative time time frame um, within every day that that's that's part of the solution and then if we can put families at the core of that that's also powerful as well so that in some way I guess the questions that we need to be asking ourselves uh, as schools and as educators is how do we put families back into that position when they've never really been there. And in many cases, um, there's been a divide between the school and families where they've you know, been fear of talking to each other or actually saying what they really think. And, and any, any thoughts on that one, Matt, as a parent um, or for all of you as well, um, about how, how do we build the trust again so that uh, families can take the lead in different learning opportunities and it's very valid. I've, um, I've found it really interesting how quickly parents have been saying things like, oh, and now, and now I have to be a homeschool teacher. And, and this kind of assumption that what this period means is that suddenly on top of everything else, on top of managing new financial pressures, health concerns, uh, logistical changes to so many aspects of life, social isolation. Now I have to learn a whole new job really, really fast or my, or my children will suffer. And so parents have kind of very quickly kind of felt that land, I think, on their shoulders. And, and one of the things that we've been talking about, Beck and I, and, and, and talking about with our circle is actually that, that's not what we need to be as parents right now, um, home homeschooling is a whole thing and, and we're not gonna learn that overnight. Um, that actually um, the opportunity here is can be a lot more relaxed than that, can be a lot more freeing than that and consistent with what everybody's been saying about trying to remove that anxiety of falling behind. Um, instead, I think to, if parents could be encouraged by their school to um, to model to their kids something that they're really passionate about, so so what is it as a parent that uh, that really lights you up? What is it that you're really excited about? Uh, what is it that you're really interested in? Is it your work or is it some hobby that you have or or some interest that you have? And share that with your child pull them into that world um, 
let them catch your energy and your your passion for that thing and and, and so so they are learning and then there is a learning and teaching moment um but if parents are trying to be homeschoolers and homeschool teachers and are trying to be t- like it's stressful <laughs> the, the idea of doing that well is is incredibly difficult um so that's what uh, that's what we've been talking about is like what we are not trying to do homeschool right now we are trying to create a an environment for our kids in which learning is interesting and fun and rewarding and it involves creativity where where we're getting our kids to make something, go and make something. What could we make today? Um, and, uh, and, and try to, to, to have them catch the joy of it uh, rather than, than the pressure of something else. So, so again, this theme of, of dialogue around these major topics, they, they need to be occurring because these aren't discussions that schools are holding at the moment. They're probably still holding, in some ways, the wrong conversations, aren't they? I want to shift again because we're at time. We're going to finish up fairly soon. Um, question from from Mitchell from California. Um, hi, Mitchell. <laughs> uh, I might throw this one back to Will. Um, it's at, it's sort of it's on the larger scale again. How do we use the global cultural movement that's occurring right now? And growing every day to improve education. Yeah, you know, what 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 do we need to do in order to capture this moment so that we don't regress? Well, first let me just say I just want to go back to something Matt just said there at the end that you know your original question was you know how do we kind of assess our success here? And I think if kids are joyful, I think we're doing a good job. Um, yep. And you know if they're having fun, if they're loving learning, and I just want to say too, I mean if kids if we had helped kids become self-directed, passionate, curious learners to begin with, this wouldn't have been such a difficult transition for when, you know, they, they got into this home kind of learning space. So um, I think, uh, you know, that's just something again for us to think about, you know, in terms of the global, the amazing thing about this moment is that right now we're online with about 400 people from all over the place, right? And we're connecting in ways that we couldn't do this even 10 years ago, Um, maybe not even five years ago. So, you know, this is the opportunity that we have. And what I'm really just impressed with and just uh, I think is profound right now is this ability for us to go uh, across the world to meet with people from much different uh, places, much different experiences. Um, It's still not as diverse as we hope it could be. Um, And again, I think that goes back and speaks to the access issue. Um, and to some marginalized communities that really aren't engaged in these conversations that I think need to be. But um, the more voices that we, can, that we can just bring into these types of spaces and to engage in these types of conversations, I, I think it's building the capacity of the world to talk about education in a different way. And the reality of it is there's a lot of capacity building to be done. Um, and um, it's going to take a long, long time before this 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 narrative really shifts in, in at scale. Um, a long time. Uh, I'm I'm thinking still decades before yeah. we get to a point where um, the experience the kids are having in school generally around the world is is substantively different from what's happening today, either online or off. But again, the more that we share, the more transparent that we are, the more that we connect, the more that we communicate and network, uh, the more I think that we can bring some coherence to a, a global call for a very different experience that kids have in school. Um, and I don't know what the steps to that are exactly, but I do know that just being having that mindset of, of continuing to dialogue and, and share uh, is going to be really important. All right. Look, we'll have one, one final comment from everyone as we, just, we wrap up this uh, event for today. Um, as we think about all of the challenges, as we think about... Uh, What's happened in the last month? What's happened in terms of the the jolt into online learning, remote learning, um, and what I like to call home learning? If you had to encourage a child, choose the age. It can be a five-year-old, can be ten-year-old, fifteen-year-old, who was struggling. What would be one word of encouragement that you would give this next generation right now about the coming months? 
which who, who would like to go first with that last? So if, if we can all think through, choose the age of the child, think how would you like to encourage that child? What would you say to them? Who would like to start? Who wants to have a go at that one? I'll start. I don't mind. Okay. I would say to a 18 year old student who was meant to be taking, you know, the final exams after 14 years of schooling in the UK, that think about now what you might really contribute to how your future world will change. So don't think, oh, I've been robbed of a chance to show what I can do. You knew you were getting prepared for that. You would have done well. You've got a bright future, no doubt. Think about how your contributions to whatever, whether it's music, art, science, whether it's thinking about the future world, how you can actually think about this sort of three month bonus without having all the stress of taking exams could actually refocus how your generation wants to see the future and think about what contributions you can make which will direct that future and put pressure on others that you haven't been this disadvantaged year but actually it's enabled you to it's empowered you to do amazing things. Okay, thank you. And Sugalug, if you choose the age and uh, what would you encourage that child? Our students are from 12, 13 until, well, 70 something, 75, I think is the oldest student. And, yeah. you know, I just think I would say just keep on with your work, you are doing well, and everything will be fine. We can figure it out all together. Just, just keep on, keep on doing what you are, what you like to do. Okay, so that, that community context of, of mutual encouragement is pretty important. Ulster, any, any final words? Think about the age you'd like to encourage and what would you say? Um probably 18, 19 years old. Uh, I would say to them, you have a voice, let us hear your voice and uh, let, let others hear your voice. That would be my encouragement. Thank you. Matt? Uh, to an eight year old child, uh, I would say uh, you have an imagination in your head that is superpower, that you can uh, use it to create things that do not exist yet, to see things that do not exist yet, uh, and, uh, and that it's incredibly fun to use. So go and make something, it doesn't matter what, uh, it doesn't matter what you do with it, just go and make something. And uh, it could be a dance, it could be a song, it could be a story, it could be a drawing, it could be anything. Go and make something. Um, this world belongs to you and, uh, and go and make it better. Thank you. And finally, Will? Those are uh, <clears throat> tough answers to follow, but I would say I think to any child of any age, something along the lines of your questions matter and follow those questions to wherever they may lead in terms of your own learning and, and your own bliss and stay joyful and optimistic. Okay, thank you. I, I, I'm gonna capture all of those encouragements because I think they were fantastic. They are uh, diverse, real, and uh, I guess they, they speak to the, the historical moment that we're currently living through. Now, enormous thanks from, um, I know the audience will have appreciated all of the input that you've given. Um, there's a lot to think through. Uh, we will we'll probably chop up the, uh, the different presentations and then and put them as a video uh, for people to download later on because there's, there's so much for everyone to think through. And I, I guess schools can actually just take each of those presentations if they wanted to and use that as a, as a provocation for conversation in their community as well. 
um, if people want to make sure that they get the downloads of the videos, if they probably need to subscribe to the YouTube channel, the Learn Life one, because that's where we'll place the videos uh, for when we release them going through. Um, but again, my my thanks to all of you. If I, I, I have some chocolate in my cupboard, if I could give it to you now and share it, I would do so. I can't, so I'll have to eat it on your behalf. <laughs> but uh, but thank you so much for your your involvement, um, for your insights, and for your wisdom, and for enabling us to meet in this way. So thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Phil. Thanks so much. Thank you, all of you. Talk, talk. <laughs> All right.